Although surprisingly, when I went to grad school, it was a lot more math. I What's that? Well, that was more for my PhD. My master's was a lot of uh, it was it was really applied stuff like pre-stress concrete design and stuff like that. But when I got to my PhD, it was a lot. When did you take your PhD? When did I take my PE? Uh, five years ago. Yeah, it was it was paper based then, so so it was, it was like one of the last ones that did the paper based exam. So, so. all right, um, let's get started. Uh, we have got uh, some discussion to be had on slip critical connections. Um, this lecture is if you understood the last homework and what we did during the last. Uh, 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 a lecture. What we're doing today, from a math perspective, really isn't much more difficult. But um, there are um, some more concepts and ideas that we need to discuss related to slip critical connections. So today, it's, there's it's kind of kind of be part story time, part you know interactive examples. Um, I talked about this a little bit last time, and I kind of want to delve into this a little more. Um, deeply today. Uh, just a little bit on housekeeping, so the attendance grades are all up to date. Homework 3.2 is still being graded, but everything up to that is, is current. And now, I mean, as I, you know, I, I, uh, the exams were graded and everything was, was distributed. So again, you all should have a really good idea of um, where you're at in the class. Just a little bit on housekeeping. So today, we're discussing slip critical connections, right? The next lecture we're going to do combined loading. That's going to be our final, um, or should be our final discussion on um, bolts. Monday, so Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of next week, what we're going to do is um, we're going to have the, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of next week is welds. That's what that's next week. Um, past that, the following week is the week before spring break. We review on Monday. We celebrate on Wednesday. No class on Friday. That's the schedule. So we are rocking and rolling. So let's go ahead and get into slip critical land. Once this will load up. Okay. We talked about this a little last time. I just want to recap. So right now, for, for bolted connections, we've only been assessing two limit states that's bolt shear and bolt, uh, bolt uh, bearing because the class of connections that we have been dealing with are bearing type connections where the resistance of load comes from the bolt physically bearing on the plate inside the, the, the bolt hole. So you have the hole, you have the bolt going through it, and then the bolt actually comes into physical contact with the, um, the edge of the hole and bears on the plate. So that's why when we look at limit states, really all we're looking at is whether or not the bolt is going to shear in half or whether or not the plate is going to fail from that bearing contact. And so. For, uh, for the plates, we have whether or not the plate's going to tear out in sort of a mini block shear type fashion, or whether or not the um, the bolt hole is going to ovalize and plastify. Uh, but on the shear side, it's just the bolt shearing in half. So it's just a function of how many shear planes you have, whether the threads are included, excluded, what your bolt grade is, what your bolt diameter is. Okay? Um, and then obviously, you know, we still have our layout requirements to meet, you know, minimum and maximum bolt spacing, minimum and maximum edge distances, et cetera. Now, I want to be clear that this was our procedure for bolt design. This is not going to change for a slip critical connection, except for step two. So in step two, what we did is we determined the shear capacity of a single bolt and then divided to get the number of bolts. Now what we're going to do is we're going to compute the shear capacity per bolt and the slip capacity per bolt and take the smaller of the two and use that to configure the connection. That, that's basically uh, it in a nutshell. Um, so what we need to do right now is discuss what is a slip critical connection, how do you compute the slip capacity per bolt. If you understand that, then the process afterwards is pretty straightforward. So let's talk about slip critical connections. Um, again, I kind of softly introduced this uh, in class on, uh, or during our last lecture, but I want to give it uh, its proper time under the sun today. So if you go back to uh, 
this schematic that we talked about a little earlier. So this is what happens when you have a bolt assembly uh, uh, installed. You know, essentially what we're doing is, so the blue forces uh, represent the forces that we are actually applying to the connection, right? So I think obviously the most important force is the force P because that's ultimately what we're designing the connection to be able to withstand, right? You're taking a bolt and clamping two plates together because those two plates are subjected to load and we want to make sure that the bolt assembly or the collection of bolt assemblies is enough to resist that load. That's obviously an important one. But the other thing to keep in mind is that you know, you're taking a bolt and you're tightening it to clamp these two plates together, you are applying a normal force to those plates, right? I mean, imagine if I have a plate, a plate, I stick a bolt through it and I start tightening, right? Those plates are going to, they're going to sandwich together. So the more um, tension or the more torque, if you would, that I apply on that bolt, the more normal force is applied between those two plates. So if I start accounting for that normal force, if I take that normal force and I account for it, and then I start loading the connection, I am going to generate a friction, uh, a, a resisting frictional force between those two plates. And that's sort of the nature of a slip critical connection. So whenever we're dealing with slip critical connections, that term slip critical, it means that we're relying on that friction between those uh, plates and, and uh, I'm going to use the term fane surfaces. So if you, if you hear me use the term fane surface, I'm just talking about the contact surfaces between those two plates. Um, we're relying on the friction between those fane surfaces to resist the load. Um, slip critical connections are very commonly used in bridge applications um, where fatigue is considered uh, is a consideration. So what I mean by fatigue is um, a, a fatigue is a phenomenon that deals with cyclic loading. So you load a system, you unload it, load it, unload it, load it, unload it, and you do that over and over again. Um, you can find that um, uh, systems can actually fail well under their design limits. I will give you a very simple example to understand. Um, if you have a soda can, right? You have a soda can with you and you want to break off the tab of the soda can. What is an easy way of doing that? What you're doing, right? Take the soda can and, and, and what happens as you do that is so you're applying a cyclic load. You're loading it, unloading it, loading it, load it, unloading it, etc. right? But the more that you do that, you start to feel something in your hand. You start to feel, wait a minute, it's kind of giving up, right? It, it's, 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 it, it's giving up. What's happening is if you were to break out a microscope and look at that, you would be introducing micro cracks into the structure of the aluminum. And then over time, those cracks start to propagate. And then near the end, it's actually failing at a much lower stress than when you started, right? So in other words, if you were to take that tab and just apply the load once and try and yank it off, it's a lot harder than if you put it through that cyclical loading event, right? Now, you're not putting a bridge through that much stress each cycle, but you are putting it through many more cycles, right? The soda can, you're only doing it like three, four, five times, whereas a bridge is subjected to millions and millions and millions of cycles. That's, that's a little bit of a tangent, but that's kind of the nature of what we're talking about with fatigue. So whenever you have applications where fatigue is a consideration like bridges, it's common to use slip critical connections. Um, but they can also, there's other applications that can also be used in joints that have slotted holes or oversized holes. So um, there are a couple of other applications for things like that. Now, if we're going to um, uh, design a connection to be slip critical, we are using, you know, essentially the same bolts, the same plates, the same bolt holes, etc. Like nothing changes from a physical perspective regarding the pieces that we're using, but what does change is the means of installation. Okay, for bearing type connections, we're just worried about getting the bolts snug tight, and, and all that means is just getting the plates in contact with one another and having the, um, the bolts be uh, tight, essentially, you know, with a few hits of an impact wrench or um, just an iron worker using an ordinary spud wrench. Um, but for slip critical connections, we have to go beyond uh, a snug tight. We actually have to use a prescribed method of installation such that we achieve the required torque necessary to count on the connection being slip critical. So that's really what defines Physically, the difference between a bearing type connection and a slip critical connection is that slip critical connections, the installation of the bolts must per, per, 
be done according to a prescribed procedure. Yes, sir. So you want to avoid the plate making contact with the bolt? Is that what you're saying? Well, that's a good question. Uh, that, all right, so let me let me um, let me address that a little bit. So um, if you ever so let's say that I had a slip critical connection, right? All right. Um, let's just say I had a plate, a plate, and let's just say a single bolt in it. Okay. And and I take an actuator and I put it on either end and I start yanking that plate apart. Okay. Um, we're going to see here in a second. This is going to be a little more uh, uh, easy to describe when we look at the numbers. But whenever you're looking at a slip critical connection uh, between the shear capacity and the slip capacity, slip capacity is always lower, right? So a rule of thumb is if you have a bolted connection and it's a bearing type connection and it needs 12 bolts and you decide, oh, it needs to be slip critical, you're probably doubling the amount of bolts because you just have less capacity. No. So going back to my example, right? So if you have a slip critical bolt installed in a plate and you start yanking on it, the first thing you're going to do is reach the slip capacity, and what's going to happen is when you do that, you're going to hear a real loud pop in the lap, because suddenly that friction is going to give up. But what's going to happen is once that friction gives up, then the bolt is going to come into contact with the plate, and then it's going to be essentially a bearing type connection, and then you're going to have bolt shear and bolt bearing to resist on, right? So if you're ever testing a, a bolt, uh, a slip critical connection in the lab, make sure you have your earring protection on, because it's boom, it's kind of loud. It kind of goes boom, so, yes. So it's kind of like if something were stuck and you kind of have to break it free first, then the bolt to catch it, like, so that when the friction breaks free, then... That's what the pop is. That's, that's what that sound is. It's that, that, sudden, that sudden popping and coming into contact. It's pretty loud, so I would not be near it. That would be bad. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the prescribed procedures. Um, uh, Probably the most common one that you see used on many sites is what's called the turn of the nut method. So the way the turn of the nut method works, it, you know, from a physical perspective, is when you go out to the, um, uh, when, once you get the bolts snug tight, so you get the bolts snug tight, and what you'll do is you'll go out and you'll make three marks on, on the, uh, the bolt assembly. You'll make a mark mark on the bolt and the plate, and these will align, right? And then you'll make another mark on the nut, okay? And so like, for example, with this one, you can see that here's the bolt and the plate, and then the one on the uh, nut, I think that looks like a third of a turn away. Is that, you see, I'll see that how that's like a third of a turn, right? And then what will happen is you will go in and tighten that nut beyond snug tight so that they line up like this right here, okay? And the idea is that once you've done that past snug tight, you've achieved the required pretension. Now you can actually go to 16.2-54. Um, they actually list the um, required pretensions for, or the required amount of turns uh, for various conditions. So just so you're aware, the 16.2 stuff is actually behind the commentary. So there's actually three specifications um, in the uh, in the manual. So the first is um, the first is the one that we're using. Yeah, everything says 16.1 dash whatever. 16.1 is just the general specification for steel structures. 16.2 is the one that's specifically for bolt installation because of stuff like this. So if you go to 16.2 dash 54, you'll see the table there where it says, you know, okay, um, dependent upon the bolt length, dependent upon um, uh, uh, the disposition of the outer faces of the bolted parts, you can see how many turns that you have to do past um, snug tight in order to achieve the required pretension. And we'll talk about what that required pretension is here in a second. Okay. Now, another um, uh, method is to use a calibrated wrench, okay? So the idea is that you actually um, calibrate a wrench to achieve that required uh, uh, um, torque necessary to get that pretension in the bolt. So um, the thing about the uh, about this on a work site is that you have to calibrate the wrench daily. So the idea is that, like as you show up to work in the morning, if you're going to start installing slip critical connections, you need to calibrate the wrench before you start using it. Um, you end up using something like this to do this. This is a device that's called a Skidmore Wilhelm. Basically what it is, is it's a super, super duper hyper fancy bathroom scale. So the idea is that you can put a bolt 
through that hole in the middle, and then as you tighten it, the dial will tell you what the pretension you're getting in in the bolt is. And so the idea is, is if, if you're using a calibrated wrench, you can install a bolt on this and then make sure that the wrench is supplying the appropriate amount of torque necessary to get that pretension. But you have to do that daily um, as you begin the, uh, the installation. Uh, I mentioned this uh, a little bit ago, uh, or, or a few days ago, when we were um, talking about why do we list group A bolts versus just calling them A325s and what have you. And the reason is that there are some uh, other bolt products that um, carry the same material properties but don't follow the same ASTM spec because they're intended for other uses. This is one of those um, methods. This is a product called a twist-off control bolt. Okay, So one of the things that's worth noting about the bolt is the top of the bolt, the head of the bolt. And does anybody notice something about this head of the bolt? The, uh, uh, I guess when you look at this, it's round, right? There's no hexagonal surface on the top. And, and the reason for that is because you're not actually needing to grip the end of the bolt when you tighten it, right? Anybody who's ever worked with their hands know if you want to tighten a bolt, you kind of need to get a wrench on both sides, right? You have to get it on the, the bolt uh, head and the nut, and you're turning them in opposite directions to get, to get the bolt tight, right? You don't really need to do that with a twist-off control bolt. So the way a twist-off control bolt works is that you have a very special wrench that what it does is it actually grips both the bolt and the nut simultaneously. So the end of the bolt has this little like splined end, right? So what happens is the wrench comes down and it grips both the nut and the head of the bolt and it turns them in the opposite direction, okay? The cool thing about it is that it's, uh, inspectors love it, right? Because once the bolt achieves the required pretension, the wrench shears off the little splined end of the bolt and so all an inspector has to do is look at the connection, and if that splined in is off, you've met the required pretension. It's kind of cool, you know. Um, it's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, the bolts themselves are expensive, right? And they're I mean obviously I think everybody would agree they're probably going to be more expensive than your uh, you know average everyday bolt, right? They are expensive. The wrench is expensive, but where do you save money? Labor. Labor. You save money on labor because it's a Heck of a lot faster installing these than using, you know, a traditional method like this. Not to, not to say this won't work, you know, but it's just an option, right? It's one of those, and, you know, prices vary, labor vary. It just depends on, you know, sort of the, the time of day, as it were, as to which method is going to be more economical. But I think this is a really simple means of achieving those pretensions. Now, one downside is that once that bolt is installed, it, it's installed. <laughs> I mean, you might have to torch it out to get it out. But... If you've got, if that's your issue, you probably have bigger problems than just the bolt. Okay. Um, another uh, option, sorry, another option is to use what's called a direct tension indicator. A direct tension indicator is basically like a washer with these little sort of nub protrusions, right? So the idea is that as you um, hit the torque, right, so the bolt's going to come into contact with the washer, which is going to come in contact with the plate. As you begin tightening the um, uh, the connection, what's happening is these the washer is actually getting squished. These little nubs are actually getting squished, and then based on that dimension, you can determine whether or not you've met your pretension. Um, standard DTIs have these little feeler gauges. That's what that little key thing looks like. It has a specific thickness. And the idea is that once you can't fit that key in there, that you hit your um, your required pretension. Uh, a more modern uh, DTI actually dispenses with the need for these uh, feeler gauges, and instead what happens is the washer has these little nubs sticking out, but on the other end of the washer there's kind of this, like, for lack of a better term, there's like orange goop that's sort of stuck in the washer, and the idea is that as you tighten it, once you hit that tension, the goop starts squirting out. And so when you see the goop, you're like, oh, I hit it. So. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of different ways to um, uh, achieve the required pretension. I believe on the, um, the like the goop, that's, a, that's a, a technical term there. I believe on the, the Nitro St. Albans Bridge, they actually, there was a new type of wrench that they used. I'd really like to get more information about. 
because they were able to use standard bolts but still able to get the required pretension by only tightening on one side. I really wanted to learn more about it, but I wasn't able to. It seemed really, really interesting because it could save a lot of money. The, the engineer on site told us how much the wrench cost, and it was a lot, but he said we, we earned that back in a day, you know, just on the amount of labor that we saved. So really cool stuff. All right. Those are the different methods um, that you can use, or some of the different methods that you can use to uh, uh, install a circuit critical bolt in case I'm going to ever decide to ask that on a celebration or something. Um, but now I want to talk about the capacity. Okay? And in short, the capacity just comes from basic physics. Okay? So if you go back to uh, old Engineering 213 or Physics 211, whichever uh, one you learned about this uh, first, if you want to determine the static friction generated by a normal force in direct contact, what you have is you have a coefficient of static friction multiplied by some normal force, right? That's, that's essentially how you get um, the, stat, the static frictional force, right? And so the capacity, so what I'm getting at is that the nominal capacity of a slip critical bolt is essentially mu times your normal force. In this case, the normal force is the bolt pretension. But then what we have to do is we have to take that and multiply it by a few adjustment factors. And so that's essentially the equation that we're going to use, right? And you can find this in, in chapter J or in section J3. It's on 16.1-134. But this equation right here, I know it looks like there's a lot of terms, but that's essentially what it is. It's just this equation with a few correction factors. That's it. Okay. Um, now, one thing that is kind of unique is that the phi value is one. That that's this is there's only I think two limits. Yeah, there's only two limit states this entire semester where we have a phi value uh, of one. And again, it just goes to the reliability uh, and the uh, the consideration for for. Um, so critical connections, but yeah, so B is one. That's not a mistake. Now, let me get into what each of these um, factors mean because they have specific purposes. Um, but a lot of times for us, they're either going to be one or um, constant values. Okay. So first off, again, the B value is one. Okay. Now, ultimately, what we're computing is R in the nominal capacity. Now, I mean, you know, we'd be adjusting it by B, but again, B is one. Okay. And so what we have is we have the mean slip coefficient. That's just our you know, coefficient of friction. And then we have TB, which is our minimum fastener pretension. Okay? Everything else is a correction factor on top of that. Okay? So let's talk about those correction factors. Now the first one is DU. Okay? And DU is just 1.13. There's no conditions. There's no... Um, uh, if the value is this, then it's that. It's just 1.13. But I want to explain what, what this term is and why it's called DU instead of just called 1.13. So what DU is is essentially a multiplier that reflects the difference or the ratio between the installed bolt pretension versus what you specify. Okay? So typically what you're specifying is about 70% of the bolt's tensile capacity. And what this is saying is that if you use one of those prescribed methods that I talked about earlier, the DTIs, the twist-off control bolts, any of those, in reality, you end up getting more pretension than the minimum, like across the board. So, in fact, what ends up happening is if you actually do the, the testing and the math and see, you end up getting about 13% more in a, a, a pretension that you actually install versus what you're specifying. So what DU is saying is that you have your minimum, uh, your minimum specified tension. In reality, you can bump that up by 13%. Now, the default value is 1.13. The spec does say that uh, you are allowed to use other values if approved by the engineer of record. So if you're on a given site and um, you're finding that your, your uh, installed pretension is actually higher or lower, you can change that. I'll be honest, I'm really not encountered many um, engineers I've seen that actually change that and it's going with the 1.13, but you can. Um, but that's just you know, my personal experience. Now, 
H sub F is a factor for filler plates. I'll explain, it'll be easier to explain that in the next slide. For us, it's largely going to be one in most instances. Um, finally, N sub S is the number of slip planes, which is basically the number of shear planes. Okay. Now, mean slip coefficient. Mean slip coefficient, if you remember from statics or from physics, um, the coefficient of friction is dependent upon the characteristics of the surfaces that are in contact, right? So if you have wood in contact with steel, you're going to have a different mu value than if you have rubber in contact with asphalt. You know, the, the, the coefficient of friction is different, okay? So there are two uh, friction coefficients that are specified in the specification. And so what it depends on is whether or not we're essentially dealing with regular old steel or um, blast clean steel, right? So the idea is if you really needed more friction, you could um, blast clean, you could do sandblasting or something uh, and actually improve the frictional resistance. But um, nine times out of 10, um, if uh, otherwise unknown, we will consider a class A fang surface, the worst case scenario, and consider a mu value of 0 0.3. So unless otherwise stated, we're going to assume a class A fang surface and assume a mu value of 0 0.3 uh, as our uh, slip coefficient. Now the minimum bolt pretension, the minimum bolt pretension comes from table J3.1. Uh, I actually think you ought to turn to table J3.1 right now because we're going to reference this here very quickly. I'll tell you, we're going to use this in class here in a second, and this will be the last time we use this table, and, and you'll see why. Um, but I want everybody to turn to this. So this is um, this is the um, minimum bolt pretension. So this is the normal force that you are getting um, uh, that you are getting from uh, uh, that you are specifying for a given bolt. So, for example, if you have a three-quarter inch diameter bolt and it's group A, you need to supply at least 28 kips of normal force. So what you're doing, let's be clear, what you're doing is you're uh, torquing that connection such that the bolt is experiencing 28 kips in tension. And the idea is that if the bolt is 28 kips in tension, that that is, by you know, law of equilibrium, applying 28 kips in compression to those two plates. All right? And... You can see they're listed for group A, group B, bolt diameter. Again, essentially it's about 70% of the, uh, the tensile strength. Okay, let's talk about filler plates. Um, let me explain how filler plates work. We're going to go back to old CE312. He said, wait a minute, Dr. Mike, we already had this. I'm not allowed to bring this up. Right? Okay, so let's make a really long beam. Let's say it's 200 foot long. Okay? So remind me, what does the moment diagram look like for this beam? Hard skip. No, that's the shear diagram. That's what, I, that's what I meant. Like that, right? Yeah, that's what I did. You, you say that and you get the <laughs> smile on your face. Like, No, this is our moment diagram, right? And this is WL squared over H. We did that. I know we did. I signed it. <laughs> I had to go back and look. Heart's getting broken right now. <laughs> Would it help if I did flow calculations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know things about stuff. So. Okay. All right. So, so the point I'm making is that the maximum flexural moment is in the middle of the beam, right? Okay. The ends of the beam are not experiencing as much flexion. Okay. Now, this is a 200 foot long beam. Do you think you're going to have an easy time transporting a 200 foot long beam across the Kobe Roads of the great state of West Virginia? That's going to be kind of tough, right? So typically what will happen is that beam will come in pieces and we will splice it together, right? Okay, so let's say we truck the beam out in three pieces, right? So we have a piece, a piece, a piece, and we truck it out, 
But here's the thing, okay? These pieces on the end are not subjected to as much moment as the pieces in the middle, right? So if we're actually looking at this connection in real time, like in the real world, this is what this connection looks like over here. So on the left, you know, we've got our flange, the web, the next flange, right? And here's, okay, so here's the left beam coming in. The beam on the right is probably a little bit bigger. Now in the real world, what that means is that usually they have the same dimension web, but the flanges tend to be a little bit thicker. I'm drawing them real thick just to sort of like make the point. Um, I mean, usually they're, you know, there's some degree of thickness, but I've kind of drawn them to be kind of cartoonishly thick to make a difference, right? So what you're seeing is the I-beam on the side, right? So if you look at an I-beam on the side, you're seeing the flange, the flange, and then the web in the middle. With me so far? Okay, so how do you connect this beam? Well, okay, typically what you're going to do is you're going to have a plate that sort of connects the webs. Maybe something like this. Probably more bolts than that, but you kind of get the idea, right? But then the other thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to connect the flanges. And then stick bolts through them like that. What's the problem? Yeah. There, there, there's a difference in thickness, right? So because this is thinner, what we'll do is we'll stick a filler plate in there. Like a small plate that the only purpose of that plate is to facilitate that connection so that you have an even thickness across the board. That's what that's typically how we do splice connections in highway bridges. So for example, if you look at that um, Nitro St. Albans bridge, all those splices, they kind of look something like this, you know? And it is also possible that you have splice or, or filler plates along the web. We typically try and keep the web depth the same across splices, but for a bridge like that, it might be uh, um, common to change the thickness of the web because, again, the shear uh, um, load changes across the span as well. Does that make sense? Okay, so whenever, so going, now going here to the slide, so what happens is whenever you splice a connection, sometimes you need to include a filler plate to match the thickness. But sometimes in steel design, like we, we steel designers tend to really spec out our plates, and sometimes the thickness difference might be like five sixteenths. And so maybe the way that you make that difference up is you use a quarter inch plate and a sixteenth inch plate. So it's not one filler plate, it's two to get your total thickness difference. Does that make sense? Well, imagine what that does to a slip critical connection. Imagine you're installing a slip critical connection where you got all these filler plates in the middle, right? That's gonna kind of reduce the effectiveness of the slip capacity there. So what this is basically saying is that if you have one filler plate or one or none, use a filler plate factor of one. Other than that, use a filler plate factor of 0.85. That's kind of what that factor is for. Now, unless otherwise stated, we're going to have HF of one for all of our uh, connections in here. To kind of walk you through how this works, let's do a quick exercise. So let's look at computing the capacity of a simple connection, and I'll show you how this works. So let's look at how do we compute the design slip resistance of a three-quarter inch A325 bolt uh, in assuming class A and fade surfaces and only one slip plane and we have no filler plates, okay? So how do we do that? Well, our capacity expression is B times mu du HF TB NS. But that's how we compute the capacity. Okay? So let's see if we can start filling in some information. What is phi? Let's make sure everybody's been paying attention. One. One. Alright. What about mu? 0.3 for a class A bang surface. So 0.3, and we'll say class A. 
bank service. DU, that's a constant value of 1.13. All right. Uh, the filler plate factor, there are no filler plates present, so this is just going to be 1. Um, TB, remember how I said you need to keep that table open? Help me out. What is TB? 28. 28 kips, right? Because it's 28 kips of for um, a group A bolt. So we'll say A325. And for a bolt diameter of three quarters of an inch. And then finally, the number of slip planes is essentially the number of shear planes. So if this is in single shear or single slip, this is an NS of one. So using all of this, somebody tell me what is PRN for a connector? So all you're doing is just multiplying all this. Nine point four nine kips per bolt. Got a second on that? Yeah. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Okay. Now, uh, I'll give everybody a sec to catch up and I'll show you why you'll probably never have to look at that table again. All right. Everybody good? So, I want everybody to turn to table 7-1 and then just turn the page. So hopefully you've got table 7-1 tab. Okay, table 7-1, that's your shear capacity. Now just turn the page, and now we have the bolt slip capacities. Okay, so if you look at that um, table, so first off, a couple things. There are two pages for this table, okay? The page on the left is for group A bolts, the one on the right for group B bolts, okay? So, everybody see that? So, there you go. Both of these tables assume a class A bang surface. So if you wanted to use class B, what you would do is you would take the capa uh, whatever capacity that you get and multiply it by 5 thirds because class B has a mu of 0.5, class B or class A has a mu of 0.3. So you just multiply it by 5 over 3. But we're in class A, so it doesn't matter. So we have the whole type, the whole type, we have standard, oversized, or uh, or lots, or uh, so we have a standard hole. Oversized or a long slotted bolt. Um, we're in standard. We're in single shear for a three-quarter inch diameter bolt. What's the capacity? 9.49, right? So we really never have to do that calculation again, right? Because it's all here. That was just to make sure that you understood what was being done, okay? Does that make sense? So, again, I, I think you'll find that the math is really simple. And again, we're using blue numbers, not green numbers. Blue numbers, LRFD. Sound good? Let's design a slip critical connection. And, and I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'll just tell you because, um, again, once we get into a certain point of the problem, you're going to realize this is kind of the same thing that we've been doing this whole time. It's really not going to be all that challenging. So I want to design a slip critical connection. I'm going to design the connection for 65 kips of dead load and 115 kips of live load. Um, we're going to be using group B bolts, uh, three uh, quarter inch diameter. We're going to be using 8572 grade 50 steel and we'll use the minimum spacing. Again, I'll just level with you. I'm not going to finish this problem, but you're going to see how I, it'll, it'll be pretty rote uh, as we get into this. I'll give everybody a second to copy this down and we'll we'll jump right into it. Notice that we have two plates lapped on top of one another. Um, to be clear, whenever you have a slip-critical connection, you do still need to check bolt shear, you do still need to check bolt bearing. 
when I, I'm going to with one caveat or one qualification. You don't really need to directly check bolt shear because what we're going to do is use the bolt shear capacity and the bolt slip capacity of a single bolt and just take the worst case scenario. But bolt bearing, you do still need to check. Everybody good to go? All right, so first thing I'm going to do is factor the load. individual bolt capacity. Okay, so let's handle each one one at a time. Let's start off with bolt shear, okay? Okay, so for bolt shear, we're turning to table 7-1, okay? So everybody turn to table 7-1, page 7-22, and let's let's take a look at this and, and make sure we're aware of what's going on. Okay, so are we in group A or group B? B. B. Included or excluded? I didn't say so threads included, yes. Three-quarter inch diameter bolt, single shear or double shear? Okay, so based on these conditions, what is VRN? And watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to say VRNV for shear. Sorry, say that again. 22.5. All right, do I have a second? Yep. Okay, so this is our bolt shear capacity. check for bolt slip. And that is going to be on the next page, table 7-3. Alright. Now, which page do we look at? The left page or the right page? Right. The right page because we're in group B. So group B All right, and what I will say is assume class A fang surface. We have a three quarter inch diameter bolt, and how many slip planes? One. Exactly. We'll call that single slip. And so now I'll say VRNSC equals what? So this is the VRN under slip critical. Now what is the capacity for this limit state? 11.9. 11 .9. Do I have a second on that? Yep. 
bolt slip capacity. So, which one do you think I'm going to use to select the number of bolts? Well, the, the lowest one. All right. Do you remember earlier when I said that if you're designing a slip critical connect, uh, connection, you tend to use about twice as many bolts? On average, it ends up being half as much capacity. It's not always the case, which is why you need to do this, but that's a good rule of thumb, right? So what we'll do is we'll say... Let's just do this right here. Step three, required number of bolts. So so we have the load divided by VRN. This is 262 kips over the smaller value of 11.9 kip per bolt. And what do we get when we check that out? 22.02. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. So honestly, what I would probably do Do 24 bolts. That's, that's probably what I would do, is try 24 bolts. Does that make sense? All right. And then, what do I do from there? Now, this becomes every other bolted connection design problem I've ever done, right? So what do I do? I say, okay, step four, lay out. Connection, right? So S min is two inches, right? LE min is one inch. And, and to be clear, you need to compute those, right? Because this is, um, well, you need to compute this one because this one is eight thirds the bolt diameter. And this is table J3.4. And so what you probably have is, you know, the, the connection or the, the, the plate is nine inches. So I'm thinking what you're going to have to do is probably something like this, probably something like one, two, three, because that makes, that makes each space, what, two and a quarter? Because if you did four... That would make each space 1.8, and that would be too close together. So, so and then 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And again, we are relying on that friction, so... That's a, we got, we need a lot of bolts, right? So this would be two inches. Um, this would be one inch, right? Um, this dimension here would be two and a quarter because I'm just evenly spacing it. And I have three edge bolts, 21 interior bolts. And so from there, what I got to do is I got to check bolt bearing, right? And just do step five the way I've been doing it this whole time, right? Compute an LCE, an LCI, 1.2 LCTFU, 2.4 DBTFU. Three edge capacities, 21 interior capacities, multiply by fee, make sure that capacity is less than 262 kips, right? So I'm not going to do that because it's literally the same step as we've been doing this whole time. So, does that make sense? Does everybody see why I selected the pattern the way that I did? You have to... 
space the beam in vertically. Let's say that again. On the vertical, in the vertical plane, you have to space them evenly. You don't have to. I mean, I think that's natural to do. I mean, what I'm saying is, if you so this is nine inches, right? Four increments makes two and a quarter, right. but five is one point eight. Right. So we can't have four rows. We won't be able to fit it, right? Right, right. Yeah. But I mean, you could like just have a row down the middle and two and two. Yeah, no, no, that's no problem at all. You, uh, whatever is easier for the fabricator, just as long as you meet your bulk space requirements at that point. Sound good? All right, I'm going to pull the code up uh, in case you need it. Um, just uh, don't lose your head for your celebration in an hour.